Amen. Because we are light. Amen. Jesus is alive. Are you ready for God's word? Hallelujah. Are you ready for God's word? Amen. Say, I'm born again. I'm born again. How many of us are born again? Meaning that we have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. No, no, I don't want you to imagine or assume that I know. Amen. Praise God. Don't assume that I, you should think I know. Right? How many of us are born again? You're born again. You're born of God. Amen. You have received eternal life. Amen. Say, I believe that Jesus Christ he is alive. I believe he died. Now, if you don't believe, don't say it. Amen. I'm just showing you how people get saved. And in case maybe you, you, you didn't know this, this is how people get saved. By believing a message. Say, I believe that Jesus Christ became a man. I believe that Jesus Christ went on the cross. I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died. died. He was buried. He was buried. After, three days, After three days, he was raised, he was raised by, the by the power of God. To say, I believe. To I, so, I, I believe. I believe. That's how a man gets saved. Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. And when a man believes, something spiritual happens for him. He only says what we just said, meaning he has heard that someone will tell him that Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ was hung on the cross. And Jesus Christ died on the cross. And after three days, he was buried. And after three days, he was raised from the dead. And when we tell you that simple message, he was raised from the dead for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. Amen. Why did Jesus come? Why did he die? Romans 4.25. Let's see that. On, we are on a teaching called spiritual combustion. Meaning the life of the spirit. Romans chapter 4. Right? Are you in verse 25? Romans 4, 25. Say, I believe, I believe. Jesus, died Jesus died for my sins. For my sins. Look at verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses? I wish somebody has it in the New Living Translation to help us, but I'll say my KJV first, just to make it everyday English. He was delivered up for our offenses, and raised up for our justification. So, okay, let us hear that in simple everyday English. Who has NLT for us? NLT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. He was handed over to die. He was handed over to die because people need to understand why Jesus died. Because of our sin. He was hand so, what was the problem of man? Sin. sin. Okay, listen carefully. Why did Jesus die? Sin. sin. Who had the sin? Man. Who had the sin? Man. Okay, while Sister um, Funke is reading for us Romans 4, someone open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We must understand why we are giving our lives for this gospel. So, Sister Funke told us that it's because of our sin that somebody came and died. All right, let's hear uh, um, verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin. He made him who knew no sin. Can we have it in NLT? Just so that we are using English that people can relate with. 21 in NLT, New Living Translation. For God made Christ. For God made Christ. Who never sinned. Who never sinned. Why did Jesus die? He became the offering, offering for our sin. Who sinned? Our sin. Man sinned. So Jesus came to take your sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At this point, you'll be saying, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Who sinned? Our sin. 
Who got in trouble? Who destroyed his heart? He became sin. An offering of sin. Who knew no? Oh, yeah, tell me. So that we could be made right with God. with God. So based on what Jesus has done, are we right with God? Yes. Based on what Jesus has got done, is God angry with man? No. Based on what Jesus has done, does man see God rightly now? Yes. That's, that's actually the real thing. Jesus became the offering for sin. He did not sin, but he offered himself for our sin. Someone said the love of God. The love of God. Why? The love of God doesn't think about himself. The love of God thinks about the other. So what, when we say God is love, what are we saying? He looked at what your problem was and he came himself to sort it out. Praise the Lord. That is the love of God. Someone declare, God loves me. me. Alright, let's go back to Romans 4.25. And he was raised to life. Why did Jesus come out of the grave? You must know why he came out of the grave. So he came out of the grave, why? To make us right with God. Are you hearing the same thing? To make us right with God. If there is anything you should pick up from this service, is the fact that you are right with God. Say, I'm right with God. God. Come on, say, I'm right with God. Say, God is not angry with me. You know, sometimes people will say, you know what? I have done this. I have done that. I have messed up. It's not that he does not know. We are saying to you, God has actually forgiven you of what you did. Can we get a believing amen? Amen. Listen, that is the reason why he died. So God is not angry with man. God just wants man to receive his love. Receive his forgiveness. Someone say, God loves me. Let's look at another scripture. Because we are talking about the love of God. Because many people live their lives tormented by the fact that they are serving an angry God. A God that they think that they need to please, that if they don't please him, he will injure them. And they now wonder why they struggle with faith. Wherever condemnation reigns, faith doesn't reign. Praise God. What is condemnation? I am not good enough. God is angry with me. There is something I've done. The condemnation is a burden. It's a weight that God has taken away from you. Praise God. Church, praise God. Praise the Lord. What did Jesus do? Jesus came and paid the full price for your sins. That is why Romans 8 verse 1 can be true. Romans 8 verse 1. Anyone wants to read it for me there? I'm ensuring that you are reading it so I'm not fast. So now. So now. There is no condemnation. There is no what? How many people here, you understand the meaning of condemnation? Let me see your hands up. If you don't understand, it's not a bad thing. Do you understand it? And don't put your hand up if you don't understand it, just because you want to be part of people that said they understand it. So at the end of the day, you don't understand it. Let's do it again. How many people here understand the meaning of um, condemnation? Do you know what condemnation means? Brilliant. Condemnation means it's a sense of unworthiness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A sense of unworthiness. A sense of I'm not good enough. I've not done enough. I am wrong. I am bad. It's a sense of negative judgment. Praise God. Praise God. Why do people struggle? You know, for example, when we talk about healing, people think it's a really big deal. When we talk about miracles, people think it's a really big deal. I understand. But it's because people don't know that condemnation is God. God is our friend. God loves us deeply. Praise God. So praise God. How many people know that Sister Timmy likes me so much? And how many people know that? How many people know that? I want to see your hands up. Okay, people don't know Sister Timmy. Okay, let's use Brad Tosin then. Because like the way Sister Timmy is looking at me and I's like, yeah, are you sure I even like you? But let me, let, 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 let me go with someone that's been with me for a very long time. That I, I know this one. Uh-huh. Brad, 
I'm not talking about Tosi likes me a lot. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know that because of that confidence, if he had something that I needed, I would not be struggling. I'll, there is a confidence that comes with me knowing that he likes me. That by the time I ask him that, you know what? I actually need 4P. He'd be like, ah, ah, 4P. Have it. You know why I'm not struggling? Like, oh my God. Oh my God. Tosin, I take it. I claim it. I have it. He will give me. Do you know why I'm not doing that? I know he loves me. So love is the greatest booster of faith. You know, believers don't struggle with faith. They get overwhelmed in his love. Faith is just the response of you meditating on his love. Praise God. Praise God. That is why John was not silent. Someone say, God loves me. Look at 1 John 3 verse 1. We are preaching the gospel. You see, as I'm preaching to you now, the power of God is here. The power of God is here. Meaning that, you know, sometimes when I talk about the power of God is here, some people always, always just think I'm talking about healing. No. Meaning that you may have come, you must come into this meeting very confused. Meaning you actually do not know what to do. You came in and you needed an answer for something. You came in and you wanted something. All those kind of things. They are normal. God, how many people say God directs? God directs. Hey, God directs. God keeps. God delivers. Yeah. It's just one of the sides. We always talk about it because people sometimes don't know. It's not the main thing. It's just, it's called sign. It's just a sign that is alive. Amen. 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 Say, God loves, me. God loves me. Come on. God loves me. God loves me. Look at 1 John 3 verse 1. 1 John 3 verse 1. I want you to go home with one thing today. That's all. You go, I want you to go home drenched in the truth that he loves you so much. And watch how your week goes. One of the things you will notice about your week is that it will be karma. Not because things in the world will change. Because your heart is in a better place. Did you hear what I just said? I mean the love of God is the, is the balloon on which we ride. 1 John 3 verse 1. Let's look at 1 John 3 verse 1. We are looking at, the, because the love of God is what makes you sure that the gifts of the spirit will work. It's the love of God that can make me print out flyer and say that even if anybody that, even if the hand has removed, will put new hand there. It's the love of God that is making us shout that way. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's look at what John said about this love of God. First John 3 verse 1. See how much our Father loves us. You know, my brain is written in KJV. He says, Behold! Behold. What manner of love? Are you seeing that now? In normal English, it says, see. Do, 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 do you know what? You know what? You know, imagine my wife is looking at me in all of the glory. I then call precious. See now. <laughs> Don't be with a woman that does not look at you like this. <laughs> are, are you getting what I'm saying? He says, see. See how much. Look at this. It, you know, it's not you that loves God. It is him that loves you. Hallelujah. Christianity is not I love God. Christianity is, oh, he loves me so much. I am now overwhelmed by this love. Have you met a woman in love before? You know, there is no fear. Like we always use Sister Simi for this example. <laughs> there is a confidence. Hey. There is a confidence that comes with love that nothing else can give. Love. That's why John said, Behold, what manner of love is this? Maybe, you know, you know, she's reading. See me reading some of those letters. Those divine letters from the anointed deacon. What? The one he picked up from the songs of Solomon. Say, your eyes. Are, are like, hey, she's already laughing. Hey, God. You know, when she has finished reading this thing, she will call her sister and say, hey, God. What manner? What is this? That's what he's talking about. The, the magnitude. The level. Because T-Boy has said, I've searched all over. I found nobody. She said, oh my God, what manner? So the Bible is God's love song to you. That you read and say, ah, he died for me. He came and he died for me. What love? Believers don't struggle with faith. They only have forgotten how much they are loved. 
That is why we confess it. Because we always forget. Praise God. Because love is not a feeling for the believer. It's a fact. Praise the Lord. Love is not what God will come and do. He has done. God, Romans 5 verse 8. God demonstrated his love. See if he loves you. He will never leave you. Hey, he said, God, Romans 5 verse 8. God demonstrated his love for us. That while we, we are yet sinners. God did not love you when you were good. God loved you as you are. While we were yet. You know one of my assignments is to change people's mindset about God. God demonstrated his love for you. That while you were yet a sinner. He died for you. So God died for his enemy. Praise God. Church, praise God. Praise God. Why did God die for you? He wanted it to be okay that he can live with you every day. Where is God? With you every day. Look at Hebrews 13. Why am I quoting the scriptures and telling you to open it for yourself? So you will see it there for yourself. Hebrews 13. Say, God loves me. I'm still coming back to 1 John 3 verse 1. I want to show you that God's love, the intent of God's love. Do you know that it is someone that loves you that wants to be with you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Beware of the person that says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Boy, he's, see, he doesn't spend time with you. Love, God wants to be with you. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Church, praise God. Yeah. God demonstrated his love. The aim of his dying is so that he can be with you everywhere you go. Look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Are we there? Verse, verse 6. Hebrews 13. Are we in verse 6? Is somebody there? Okay, let's read it from verse 5. Do not love money. Be satisfied with what you have. Why did he start off with don't love money? That's one of the greatest things that fights God in the heart of men. That's why. It says, don't love, but be satisfied, satisfied with what, you have. what do you have? Uh -huh. For God has said. God has said. Who said? God. Who said? God. What did God say? I will never fail you. I will never. Ah, my brain is in KJV. I will never leave you. Uh -huh, tell me. No for, no, for sake. What did he say he will not do? You never leave me. Do you know that Greek scholars say that that statement is the highest double negation? Double. Meaning, do you know what he said? He said that I will never, never, not ever, ever, will I ever, ever leave you. Meaning, he has, you know, you know when you want to talk and you are talking to the point that the person you are talking to says, ah, ah, he's okay. It's just like saying, I love you ever, ever. In loving, do I love you? Everly, will I love you ever? Blah, ah. <laughs> so God is saying, I will never, ever, not will I ever, ever. Meaning there is nothing you can ever, ever do to ever, ever make me stop loving you ever, ever. Ah, ah. That was how he said it. Praise God. Hallelujah. I will never leave you. Why did he die? To make it a reality. That you will see it as so. Where is God? With you. Hallelujah. Much more. Where is God actually? In you. I will what? Never leave you. What are you to do? You are to become conscious of it. Everything in scriptures. Please listen carefully. Everything in scriptures will be written to you. You are the one that will take it personally. I will never leave you. What do you say? He will never leave me. That's how you personalize the scriptures. He will never leave. Oh, I don't feel like it. He will never leave me. Praise God. No, it, it doesn't matter what the reality is. God never leaves the believer. He can never see love. The, the Bible says, Ecclesiastes, oh, it's uh, no songs of Solomon. It says, Kiss me with the kisses of your lips, for your love is better than wine, your love is greater than death. He's saying to you, There is nothing, I am your lover. 
Praise God. Church, praise God. I will never leave you. What else? Nor forsake you. Is that where I stopped? What is the next verse? What is my response to the love of God? So, okay, let, 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 let's do it well so that, okay, let Brother Sodic finish it. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake, forsake you so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not. Yes. What man does too? So you get it. So, what did he say? I will never leave you. Say me. You know, because when we talk about the Bible, some people think we're talking about some esoteric people that, you know, don't exist. You know, we're talking about Elisha, Elijah. No, no. I will never, he said, he will never leave me. No, no. he will never leave me or forsake me. That's why I boldly say. Did you see that there's a response to what God has done? He will never leave me nor forsake me. You are the one that will not say, oh, he will never leave me nor forsake me. Then you start to, you are bold. Boldly say. What is your boldness? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Say, I will not fear. Will not fear. Say, Who is your helper? The Lord. Who is your helper? The Lord. Who is your helper? The Lord. The Lord. That is why fear goes. Fear goes as I remember God's presence. Did you hear that? Fear goes as I remember God's presence, that God is with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why do we share these things again and again and again? People forget. So repetition is important. That's why I know you have read Colossians. Read it again. I know you have read it. Read it again. Why? Repetition is good for you. Why? Your mind forgets. Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He will never leave me nor forsake me. So I boldly say, the Lord is my helper. You know your boast in life is God, not your abilities. His presence with you. You know that was why Moses would say in those days, if you're, ah, we are going somewhere, if your presence will not go with us, don't let us go. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. And you know that when the, Philist, um, um, when, when the Israelites were having a hard time with the Philistines, so one of them said, let us go and get the Ark of the Covenant. It was the symbolism of the presence of God. Right? And the moment the Ark of the Covenant came to the battlefield, all the Israelis started to shout, we've won. As long as it's with, we've won. Praise God. Praise God. Church, praise God. Say, God lives in me. He loves me. Look at 1 John 3 verse 1 where we were. Behold, come and see. Come and see. Okay? Are you there? Behold. What manner? What kind of thing is this? The Father has given unto us that we may be called okay let's read it in the NLT version so that it makes sense right first John 3 1 let's have that see how very much see are you seeing the word see how very much. Ve someone say very much. very much say God loves me, God loves me. Very, much. very much come on very much very if much. you like so very very much, very, very much. you know I'm telling you practically, a sense of tranquility comes to the mind of the one that believes God's love. Amen. 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 In fact, God's love for you should be the foundation of your activities. If not, you will burn out. If not, you will always be complaining. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. See how very much the Father loves us. What else? Who are we? You know, it looks like we are talking basic Christianity, but people forget. See how very much the Father loves us. The Father loves us so much. What did He do? Who are we? 
So to be called a child of God is such a big deal. That when Paul was writing about it, Paul said, John said, this is the proof of God's love. That we are now fellow heirs. We are what? You know what fellow heirs are? I'll explain to you. All right? Say, see how much the Father loves us that we have been called sons of God. In a normal home, in a normal home, right? Who gets the inheritance? For example, if a, if a man is about to pass on, I mean, without many, many, maybe his children have offended him when they were young, and he has just made up his mind, I'll deal with you when I'm gone, right? <laughs> You know, and then he just says, give all, give, all my, give all my money to my neighbor. You know, just to annoy the children. I'm saying in, in a normal situation, who, who does the inheritance go to? Sons. Uh, uh, wait. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. We are getting into funny territories now. We have some fresh. <laughs> hey. You know, if we follow that theory of firstborn, it won't even reach you. <laughs> For Christ is the firstborn. <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, right, we are talking about sons. So when we say we are the sons of God, really, God has how many sons? How many sons does God really have? He's got one. God has got how many sons? One, but we, who are we? We are in the sun. Praise God. Church, praise God. So when we say we are sons of God, it's correct because we are in the It's just like, for example, if you give me ice cream, my whole body took the ice cream, including my lungs and kidneys. Amen? So if you can't say, I gave Dio the ice cream, but you know what? I really don't like his kidneys. Too late. The kidneys and I are one. So who does God have? A son. What is the good news? We are now in the son. What does that mean? The father loves us. He integrated us into the son. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we are now, so we say we are joint heirs. So whatever the son has, who else has it? We do. Amen. Amen. Church, amen. amen. It's just like if a man comes into, you know, uh, uh, he wants, he's about to die and he just uh, say, see, listen, I don't, I don't trust all this lawyer. I want to read my will myself. I know I'll soon die. Hello? Hey. See me. My left shoe. Tola. My right shoe. Tola. My left shoe. See me. My right shoe. Are you getting what I'm doing? He's actually just trying to say, everything I have, the two of you will share it. Praise God. Church, praise God. That is the state of the believer in Christ. Amen. And it's such a big privilege. Amen. But the, what we are actually sharing with ourselves today is the fact that human beings, believers forget the love of God. They forget the kindness of God. They forget the fact that God loved them. He gave himself for them. That's why we're reminding you. Praise the Lord. Look at, look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Are you in Romans 5? Okay. I'm going to read it again. From verse 8. We're talking about the love of God today. And I said to you, I have only one thing I want you to take home today. God loves me. Hold your hands in the book of Romans 5. I want you to quickly go to Galatians 2. Galatians 2. Amen. Galatians 2.20. We'll come back to Romans 5. Are we in Galatians 2.20 now? Okay. Look at what he says there. I am what? Crucified. Church, I am what? Crucified. Who? Amen. See, what did you just say? You are what? Crucified. 
You know, I can say you're a liar. Do you know I know you have faith? Do you know I know you have faith? Bookie, you know you have faith. You know what Bookie just said? She said, I am what? You're a liar. How many people saw where Bookie was crucified? See, I want to. <laughs> let, let's say, how many people were there where Bookie said, Everybody, come, oh, come, oh, crucifixion party. I'm going to crucify myself. But what is Bookie saying now? I am what? Cruci so we can say it's a lie. Because while it is true that Buki was crucified, we did not see Buki physically what? Crucified. Buki is identifying with what someone else has. Have you been, have, have you been to an award ceremony before? Where someone wins an award and he comes, in, he comes to the award ceremony with his bandwagon. You see people like 17 will follow him. He will get to the, to, to the podium to give speech. Be like, then people start saying, we did it, we did it. No, one person did it. One person sang the song produced was in the album, but he has friends. So the friends, the friends, bestie, everybody are going together. We, we took it. We did it. We did it. Yes, we did it. We did it. But who really did it? The person they gave the award. You know, when I, have you met some fans? Like Chelsea fans and those kind of people like that. Right? You know, you, <laughs> you know the, the, the funny thing is that it's so funny that you hear, we beat them. Ah, bro. It was played at Stamford Bridge. You were you were at Shafford Hundred eating rice, and you beat them. How? But yes, the person believes it. You know that day is happy, he's smiling everywhere. Wow, we did it. Oh, what? We it would be analyzing it. The strategy that we used. You. You even said my coach did a good job. You did. Did you hire any coach? But what is that? Identification. He sees it as real. Because when they lose, his wife will not be thinking, hey, wait, wait, God, should I go ask him for food or should we just leave it? Because it really affects him when they lose. Because this brother believes that he's Chelsea. He, like, he, be, he will even wear the jersey and give himself number and say, number five. TB. In a, in, uh, no, number five. Oh, yeah, striker. I <laughs> he believes it. Are you hearing? And he's emotional about it. See, what you believe will affect your emotions. What you believe. See, if it does not start affecting your emotions, you, no, no, no. What you believe would affect your emotions. It, you, will be, you are affectionate about what you believe. Have you ever seen where they scored someone's, they scored their team? Or, let's put it better. Your team scored in a football match. You don't say, oh, that's a good goal. In, in, lovely strategy. No. Those ones, they're never introverts. They, no. When they score, you go. Even when I say, I'm very, very quiet, I'm laid back, I'm introverted. Go! Yes, we did it. I knew it. I told you I'll beat you. Yes, yes, yes. Get in there, boy. It affects your emotions. You don't see, you, you see serious fans. When, if you're in a, in a, you walk in a place where, I'm just trying to get a point to you. If you walk in a place where which everybody in your, t your, your, your office, they have a particular football, you will know that productivity, if you're in a particular office, where which everybody there is asked now. And it's Monday morning. You, as a manager, you just know. Monday morning, they played on Sunday. They beat them 8 0. Just know that you will see a lot of mistakes on Monday morning. Everybody will just be. be Hello, how was your week? Because uh, yeah, this terrible nonsense. We just, uh, let's, let's just move on. Why is that happening? He, he actually thinks he's us now. <laughs> and he's affecting his work. And there is nothing that can happen to his work that will ever affect us now. <laughs> but I am saying that the law of identification, his brain sees it as so. Praise God. You'll be here and we won the cup. I am trying to tell you that there is emotions with what you actually believe. When they say Jesus Christ came out of the grave, you say, mm -mm -mm -mm. my brother, you still need to meditate on that truth. God loves you and he doesn't shock you, but a God shocks you. You see that we should say there's something wrong. So it's just that you don't see it as you ought to see it. Praise God. Just praise God. You are emotional about what you believe. Praise God. Hallelujah. We are in Galatians 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless, I live. That's the mystery. How can you die and live? Amen? Amen. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, now I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who did what? Who loved me. And what did he do? What will be the only proof that you have that God loves you? He gave himself for you. Praise God. So, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the proof of God. It is the only proof of God's love for you. If you look at the Bible, let me tell you something so that you are clear. Things happening in your life is not a proof that God loves you. The biblical proof of God's love for you is that he sent his son to die for you. Praise God. And it has already happened. So you are not someone that you are in a position to question his love. Because he has already died. He has come out of the grave. And he lives in you. Amen. He has sorted out your biggest problem. The biggest problem man had was a sin nature. God has given you a new heart and a new spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, you know where in Galatians 2.20? Please stay there. He gave who loved me and gave himself for me. But do you know what you can do? You can do verse 21. But that's why we teach, so you don't do verse 21. Look at Galatians 2, verse 21. Are you there? Yes, Brother Victory. Oh, no. Please come and change this. Battery out. Amen. amen. Church, amen. amen. Church, amen. amen. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Look at verse 21. Verse 21. Are you there? Verse 21, are you there? I do not. What can I do after God has done all he can do? According to verse 21, what can I do? What can I do? I do not. Frustrate the what? What is the grace of God? Is in verse 20. Who loved me and gave himself. What can I do? I can frustrate. Please, are we together? I can frustrate the grace of God. Look at verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Tell me what else it says. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So he's saying if you keep going about acting like you need to do something for God to love you, you are frustrating the grace of God and you are acting like he did not die for you. Love. Praise God. What do people actually do? They frustrate the grace of God. They act like he has not died for them and given himself for them. So Christians sometimes today are trying to do things so that God will love them. What does the Bible call it? Frustrating grace. That's why if you find those believers honestly, they are not happy, they are not fulfilled, they are not satisfied, they are not in peace. They get more money, more this, more that. They are never at peace because you cannot by works be right with God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You, God does not love you because you do things. God loves you because of his nature. His nature is love. What do you do when you try to do things so that God will love you? The Bible calls it frustrating the grace of God. God does not call you to come and do things so that he can love you. Love is his nature. Amen. Because a lot of very nice, good believers, like Esau. One day I'll show you the story of Esau. Esau was a good guy. But Esau's problem was that he wanted God to accept him based on what he does. The Bible says even Esau actually tried his best till he was crying, but was not accepted because he tried to come to God based on what he did. Lord, see now. See what I've done. I'm nice to brother T-boy. I gave Mr. Sunday this. I did this. Why, why don't you love me? What does the Bible call that? Frustrating grace. You don't go to God saying the things you have done. You don't. What are you actually doing? You think you are, and that's why sometimes when you hear the prayers of people, you understand where the problem is. They have been taught that you know what, there are things you need to do to make God happy. No. God is not emotionally poor. Amen? God is whole. God does not need therapy. God does not need affirmation, validation. God does not need it. 
He is your God. Praise God. Your father is complete. Praise God. If God needed something from us, he can't be our God. He can't be our father. He is not dependent on us. So the idea is God has loved us already. Amen. Amen. Church, amen. amen. Someone say, God loves me. God loves there is nothing, nothing I can do to make God love me more. Let's say it again. God loves me. There is nothing I can do to make God love me more. But this is the catch. The more you see the reckless love of God, the more your heart wants to replicate, wants to do the things that we do. All these Christian things, the things that we do, we do them not so that God will love us. We do them because God has loved us. Amen. Amen. Do we still serve the saints? You know, a lot of people hear only one part of the message. God loves me. It doesn't matter what I do. It's okay. God loves you is true. He doesn't look at what you do from the perspective of loving you. Amen? But the idea is, as you know the love of God, it strengthens you. It instructs you. It directs you to actually now love on others and do things. So what you call coming to church early, serving the saints, giving in church, praying for your brother. You, the normal believer doesn't do it to make God happy. The believer does it as a service knowing God has loved him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you don't hear the full message, you go away with God loves me, I can do anything. And you get into trouble by yourself. God loves me, I can do anything. If you live anyhow, you open your life to the devil. It's very simple. God loves me. If I get angry, he doesn't do anything. The Bible already tells you, be angry and sin not. Let not your anger be of a long spell. Unless you open your door to the devil. Simple. Amen. So is God mad that you know, but your action has opened yourself to the devil to hit at you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, 10 to 12. God is, not, God is not upset when you don't forgive your neighbor. He's not upset. It's just that in not forgiving your neighbor, you open yourself to the devil. He says, do not be overtaken by the devices of the devil. Praise God. Another reason why we actually forgive our neighbor is that we are practicing the life that we lived. He forgave us, so we forgive. Praise God. Church, praise God. When you say you are struggling with forgiving people, you are struggling with a habit, you are struggling with anything, the answer is simple. You are struggling with a sickness or a disease. Keep remembering what God has done. What has God done? God has provided his love for you. God has given you his love. God has given you his forgiveness uh, so you can forgive others. Don't think about what people do. Think about how great his forgiveness is to you. Praise God. Church, praise God. Church, praise God. The more I think about God's goodness to me and how he's good and kind to me, I now become kind to others. I am not kind to others because I want God to give me a mark. I am kind to others because that's what I experienced with God. I am like him. Uh, he lives in me. Praise God. Because you must know why you do what you do. I am not giving so that God will give me something. I am not saying God does not give me, but the essence of giving is not so that God will give you something. The essence of giving to others, giving to the church, is that you have recognized that God has given to you in giving you his life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, praise the Lord. I, like I said to you, all I want you to remember today is the fact that God loves you. Thank you Jesus. There is no condemnation for them that are now in Christ Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. 
what can separate us. Let's end today in, with Romans chapter 8. Let's end today with Romans chapter 8. Say nothing. nothing. Say nothing. 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 nothing can separate me. We are in Romans 8 verse 35. Nothing can separate me from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not, someone say nothing. nothing. Someone say nothing. nothing. Someone say nothing. nothing. Someone declare God loves me. God Put me. your hand on your heart. God loves, me. God loves me. You might think it's just a little joke, but you might need to remember that little nursery rhyme you rem that you were taught when you were in Sunday school. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. You need to remember it. Why? The mind always forgets. There is nothing I can do to make God love me more. A lot of people are depressed. They are down. They've not forgiven themselves. They've been beaten, battered. They think God is angry with them. No. The good news is God loves you. And nothing can separate you from the love of God. Someone say nothing. nothing. Come on, say nothing. nothing. Let us look at it for ourselves in the book of Romans chapter 8. We are going to read Romans chapter 8 as a church from 32 to 39. And we close in this service today. Are you ready? Yes. Amen. Alright. I'm going to start off with verse 31. Just so that you can get there. It says, what shall we say to these things? Are you with me? Are you here? If God, church, if God be for us, who can, who can be against us? How is God for us? Verse 32. He that his own son, what did he not do? He spared not his own, but delivered him up for us. For how many of us? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In the original, all these things. Look at verse 33. He's talking about you. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You see, that is the issue with the minds of men. Life. Situations. Circumstances. The devil. Sin. Laying things to the charge of the hearts of men. You ain't good enough. You've done this again. You've wronged the game. You're not, you're not worthy. That's why your children left. That's why your husband left. That's why this. That's why that. And men walking up and down, smiling, but they have heavy consciences. Because things have been laid on the charge. People feel with bitterness. Because their, char their hearts have been laid up with what other men have done, other things that happened in their lives. Look at it. He says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that what? Justifies. God has declared you righteous. Look at verse 34. One of our beloved men of God actually said, 70% of sickness and disease comes from a root of condemnation. So the truth about the condemnation, what God has done to condemnation, emotionally, mentally, to the mind of a man, is healing to him. Look at verse 34. Who is it that condemns? It is Christ that died, that is risen again. Who is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? We get to where we are going to. Who shall separate us from the? Oh, shall tribulation? You know why he's saying it's tribulation? Things on this earth. You go through a pressing time. Your stand for the gospel. It gets to a point that people hate you because of the gospel. He says, no, God is still with you. Shall tribulation or distress. So you see that the Bible does not say we will not go through some tough times. All the Bible just says is that in the midst of that tough time, something you must not forget. God loves you. And the love of God for you can never shake. Look at it. Or persecution. Or farming. You know sometimes people think the reason they don't have money is because of God. No. No. He says even in the midst of a farming. There is something we know. He loves us. Look at He says. He says. Or nakedness. You have nothing. You know a lot of people are covetous. They think God is with them when they have money. And he has left them when they don't. Paul is saying in nakedness. Or peril. Or swords. Look at it. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day. This was what was happening. 
in the days of Paul to be declared, to declare yourself as a Christian, you'd be beaten to a pulp. Him himself was beating people to a pulp and killing them at some point. It was a, you were a, an endangered species to be a Christian. That's why I always tell people, you know what? Buckle up! You're not going through much compared to what they were going through. In those days, you say you're a Christian, you might not make it back home. Because there is a Saul who has gotten a letter from the governor to put you in prison. And you will still see men troop out to go to church. You see men troop out to gather. You see men they will troop to the daily house to house fellowship they were doing in those days. Nothing. And when they said, don't preach this gospel anymore, they look back at them and say, no, we will. what are you telling us to do? We will not but preach the things that we have seen and heard. A conviction. A conviction. A, that is born of the love of God. Look at it. It says, who shall separate us? As it is written in verse 36, it says, we are killed all day. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at verse 37. Are you in verse 37? Yes. Church, are you in 37? Yes. What did he say? In how many things? Oh, all these things. You, you know you can continue forever. It's famine, persecution, this, that. What did he say? Nay. In all these things, who are we? Who are we? We are more than conquerors. Meaning that, see, farming, nakedness, peril, sword, no matter what we go through, God in us is still a fact. Amen. Church, amen. amen. Look at it, look at it again. It says, for I am persuaded. Do you know, do you know, verse 38 is something you take. When you're having a hard time, when you're going through a hard time, you take verse 38. Nay, in all these things, if men ostracize you, when men say that there's nothing good that's going to come out of your life, when in preaching the gospel and standing for Jesus, you are actually being cast aside. When the whole world, when, when your, the, your mind is bombarded by things even on the earth, nay, you say no, in all these things. In all these things. In all these things. Imagine Paul. Paul was actually beaten with rods. He was beaten to a point that he died. He entered sheep. It actually capsized. He went to Malta the other day. The Bible says a snake beat his hand. This man still came out and said, I will never ask where is God. He said, nay. In all these things. We are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us shall glory. In all these things. Brother, sister. It's not that you're not going through a rough time. You say no. In all these things. We are more. We are more than conquerors. When your emotions want to let you down, you say, no, sister. We are more. We are more. We are more than conquerors. For Jesus lives on the inside of us. We are not saying famine will not come, or peril will not come, or swords will not come, or whatever comes. What we know is there is one who is alive, who lives in us, who has sworn. Never ever. It doesn't matter. Never ever. Will he leave us, nor forsake us? We say, nay. Our mind is saying, ah, he has left you. You say, nay. It looks like it physically. It looks like you're in a desert. You shall know in all these things. We are more than conquerors. Look at it. Look at it. Let's close. It says in verse 38, it's a persuasion. Say, I'm persuaded. Come on, I'm persuaded. Say, I'm persuaded. Look at it for yourself. I'm persuaded. It says... For neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers of the things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us. Separate us from what? Separate us from what? Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Rise upon your feet, that beloved, that beloved of God, rise upon your feet.